here's the first workshop, which is on QKD. And um, we will be, I, I'll be talk, I'll be giving um, five lectures in this. My first lecture is on classical cryptography and limitations. My lecture two will be on QKD, quantum characteristics leading to BBA24 protocol. And just an introduction of one protocol in this case. And then um, the third lecture would be on QKD with noise, where we talk about the, um, the uh, attacks as well and how the noise is dealt with. And then in lecture four, we have entanglement based QKD. So we use, uh, we will study about entanglement properties and what entanglement characteristics are going to be um, used in, um, um, in, the, uh, in this um, uh, QKD protocols, right? So I start uh, here with my first lecture. So it's a classical cryptography, which is um, um, which I'll talk about and also about its limitations. So uh, my uh, in the classical cryptography, uh, we know what that, that cryptography is just like encrypting encrypting your message in such a way that somebody who is uh, listening to it, who is reading it, cannot simply just uh, get what what actual message is. So give it in, giving, giving it in a hidden form, right? This is just the classical cryptography. So we have many methods for classical cryptography. We divide it into two main parts, like symmetric um, cryptography and the asymmetric cryptography. In the symmetric cryptography, so I'll talk about both of them, but in the symmetric cryptography, we have, um, so our main, main uh, aim is to encrypt a message and then um, so send it uh, the encrypted message to the ciphertext, just like you can see there, there's a plain text M. There's an encryption machine E, which encrypts the message, and then it creates it into ciphertext EM, right? And um, then uh, the, uh, the uh, so it is encrypted using the public key K, and um, when, when it is sent through the channel to the, to the receiver, he will decrypt it using the same public key, right? And it will get the plain text message again. So here the, Main thing is that the uh, that the um, key that is being used here is symmetric in both for both uh, sender and the receiver, right? So this is what the symmetric cryptography is. So this was in fact in use um, right from the beginning, and this is the symmetric key cryptography, which is um, uh, which was used in the ancient times as well, which was used in all all the ciphers. Up there. So I would say that if I have a if I have an encryption, then um, I would have um, like um, I would do the encryption using the using my message. It is E M, and if I decrypt it, which my decryption is D. So if I decrypt it, the whole thing, I should get my message back, right? So this is what the uh, encryption in this case is. So I have an encryption. I do it with the decryption, a decryption machine, and project the message. In every QPD, it is like that. But sorry, in every cryptography, it is like that. But for the symmetric one, there's only one key. So the older ones of, of the of the ciphers, which are which have been used before, uh, they would choose the symmetric cryptography, like Caesar cipher. What was it? That um, the, the, it's the substitution cipher as well. So every letter in the alphabet scheme is replaced by. Um, uh, by some forward letters or backwards, replaced by some other letters, letters right? So this is the substitution uh, method. So for example, every D is replaced by A, every E is replaced by B, every F is replaced by C, and so on. So they just move um, two, pl two places backwards, right? Um, so it would be, um, so this is what the Caesar cipher is. And then there are many modifications, there are many other um, uh, substitutions that can be used in here. And then we had Sky Tales, which was um, there um, in 7 BC. And it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's the random alphabets which are written in there. And when, the, when you have to send a message, it is wrapped around the cylinder. And anybody having the same cylinder length, same cylinder radius, can decrypt it. So nobody knows what the uh, radius of the cylinder that is being used. So whenever the cylinder radius is same, then of course you can decrypt the message. And uh, then, of course, there was an Enigma machine, which was which, which is which was in the 20th century, and um, it was used by Germans in World War One, and um, uh, they uh, in World War Two, sorry, and they lost the um, um, and the war because the Enigma was was broken, the code was broken. There. So all of these are in fact breakable because there is no such thing as um, uh, as uh, proving that they are perfectly secure. They are just based on how difficult it is to, to decrypt them, right? So this is the limitation of the symmetric key cryptography. So then we move on to the asymmetric cryptography, classical one again, but um, it uses two different keys, right? So in this method, uh, our internet security, which is it is based on these uh, asymmetric cryptographic schemes, as you can see that in the asymmetric one, there are two keys. One is a public key 
and the other is a private key. So we have um, the same plain text message M, right? It needs to be to be sent to the uh, to somebody, and uh, we have an encryption machine which encrypts the message using a public key, right? So in this case, the public key uses the is used to encrypt the message. And then it is, a ciphertext is created using this in message and then using the public key and it is sent through the channel. And of course, anybody while it is going through the channel can attack it, can read it, and but it, in order to decipher it, one needs the private key. So the private key is with the, uh, with the, with the, with the receiver who has to decrypt it and um, only the one who has the private key can decrypt the message. So it is, it is done in such a way that um, uh, that the um, uh, private key is um, um, th that the in fact the receiver he creates both the keys right, and he creates it in such a way that um, uh, with, with such a thing that it's um, it is easy to with one way functions which are easy to compute in one way and are difficult to compute in the other way. So for example, you have an uh, an n, then you create a function of n in such a way that if you know n, it is very difficult to form function of n. But uh, from the function, uh, but, but somebody who has, um, uh, who, who, somebody knows the function of n, then he can use the private key. For example, uh, one such thing is the prime factorization of the number. So my n is in fact, uh, uh, has two prime factors, which can be a and, and b. And these prime factors, if somebody knows a and b, then he can um, decrypt the message a and b separately. So my public key will be made of, uh, this n and my private key would, would use these a cross b. So it is if it will be very difficult to break it if somebody doesn't know these prime factors in any right? So it is just a one-way function. So you can compute it in one direction um, that is having n, you can you can use it to encrypt your message through the public key, but in order to decrypt that message, one has to know a and b separately. Right, so this is one way of doing it. And the RSA encryption, which was by Rivers, Shamir, and uh, Edelman, which is still in use, is based on this, this one way function. So let me explain this, um, this um, um, encryption method to you that uh, you can so that you can appreciate that how, how it works and how fragile it becomes when uh, it comes to, um, to, the, uh, to the power of quantum computing. Um, so let's select, it's, it goes in such a way that first we select uh, two prime numbers, right? And which, which are like um, A and B, right? So we are selecting two prime numbers, A and B. And we calculate N, right? So we calculate N from here. And where N is simply A times B. So you have an N number, which is, which is computed from A and B. Then you select E, right? This is all what is doing this, uh, the receiver. He is creating this encryption. So this is all the encryption part. So he selects E, E in, su in such a way that um, your E is an integer, right? There are certain conditions on E. E is an integer. E is not a factor of, um, E is not a factor of uh, this quantity, phi n is equal to A minus one into a b minus one, right? E is not a factor of that. Otherwise, e can be an integer. And of course, you uh, make the condition that your e is um, greater than one, an integer, but it is less than phi of n. Okay, phi of n is also an integer because a and b were integers, so it is just the product of a minus one into b minus one. So this is how uh, e would be chosen, and then you make your public key. So public key. Once you have chosen a and b, you can make your public key by just taking um, uh, key would be P would be equal to E N. This is your public key. So you gave this number, these two numbers, E and N to the sender, right? And this is public, this is, this is known to everybody. Then comes the decryption. I said that if somebody uh, makes the decryption, uh, the, the private key from there, it can decrypt the message using that. So I come to the decryption. So how the decryption is done. So the decryption is done using um, again, phi of n. So whoever has created this key has, has, it does know all of these things, right? n, a cross b, a and b, and phi n, and e. He knows everything. And then while doing the decryption, he would be doing in, in such a way that um, it takes the phi n. So my phi n is equal to a minus one into b minus one, which was earlier known. And uh, this is only known to the, uh, to the one who is decrypting in the public key. 
uh, in the private key. So um, then uh, we have uh, some number k, right? And we uh, we we make a, um, uh, a, 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 a computer d, which is given as k, and phi n k dot phi n plus one, and um, over e. And for this k, it could be like this. And um, sorry, this is phi n plus one. And um, then I have like, um, it, it should be in such a way that my E into D mod of phi n. So it is created in such a way that E into D mod of phi n should be equal to one. I'll give you an example and then you will of course understand that how this encryption and decryption is being done. I'm just giving you the, the, the matrix from here. So then I will have my private key and my private key is, uh, is given as um, uh, S is D and N. So I will encrypt my message using uh, E and N, my public key, and I will decrypt my message using this private key S, which is made from D and N, right? Okay, now let's take an example. Um, that, take an example of, an, uh, of a message that we want to encrypt and then we'll decrypt it. So take an example that we have um, to send, uh, we make our keys first. So we choose two numbers, just as I said, there are two numbers. A is, let's choose it to be 53 and B to be 59. And then I have N, N is, um, I compute N, which is um, A into B, and it will be equal to um, 53 into 59, and it will be equal to um, 3127, right? So I have my N, which is 3127. And my phi N, of course I need phi N for that, and my phi N will be equal to A minus one, um, and into B minus one. This is my phi n, and this will be equal to 52 into uh, 58, and this will be equal to uh, 3016. Of course, the numbers that I have chosen here, A and B, these are prime numbers, right? Because we are interested in making, in finding out prime numbers for that. So I have my phi n, which is 3016, and I will have now um, this, um, I insert a page here. So I have now, um, so I have my phi n and I have my n over here. And um, then I select E, right? I can take any E which is greater than one and which is less than five, uh, mod of five. So I have, um, I, I choose an E, I can choose an E to be, it to be E, it to be three, right? So let's take um, um, E to be equal to three. And then my public key, I am now done with my public key, which I have to go give it to the sender. So my public key is then um, NE. So it is equal to, and it would be then equal to, I just get these two numbers, 3127, which was my N, and I get this number E, which is three to my, um, to, to, the, to the one who is sending the message. This is my public key. And everybody knows it, right? Anybody who wants to listen it to the Ill illegitimately and all the legitimate users, everybody knows it. Now I need the uh, private key from here. So in order to make the, so this whole thing was to make a private key, a public key, sorry. So I have now got the public key. Now I go for the, go for the private key. And it would be, so my private key will be, will be done in such a way uh, that it will be, so now I know the ingredients for the private key. My private key is phi n again, starts from phi n. Phi n is um, um, 3016, and which is a minus one into b minus one. And um, my d is then simply k into phi n plus one. So my k can be anything as well. And it is divided by e. So I take the k to be equal to two, and it is 3016, which is my phi of n, and then plus one, and then divided, this whole thing is going to be divided by E, which is three, and it comes out to be 2011. This is my D. Okay, so my private key is now this set, which is uh, which comprises of N and D. And so my private key is N D, which is um, 3127 and 2011, right? D is 2011 and 3127 is that. So both public key and private key have an in common, but of course um, there's this D as well, which the, which the private key has, which is un totally unknown to the, uh, to, the, to the sender because uh, it is made from phi N and nobody knows phi N. And um, so, so this is what the private key is. 
So now if I have to send a message, for example, I have to send a message to, to, to them, like I want to send, hi, this is my message, right? And I have, um, so my, I, I would convert first hi into, into, the, into a number. So I take this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, and I give them numbers, right? Anything. So everybody knows these numbers, okay? Everybody knows this, this key. So it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So my high would be eight and nine, which is 89, right? So my message is, uh, my message in fact is high equals to 89. This is my message, which was in fact B up there. Okay, so I now, now I need to encrypt the message. Okay, so I encrypt the message uh, using the uh, using my uh, private key as you're using my public key and um, encrypting the message means that I would be from high I have to encrypt the message so my encryption would be would be done like um, C, uh, it would be um, C. Uh, so encryption is just a ciphertext right so it is C, which is a ciphertext which is going to be made public, right? Which is going through the channel to me. So it is P, my message, E, which I, I have the key, right? My key is N and E. So I have P, E, and mod of N, right? So this is what my uh, what my cyber text is. And it is equal to 89 is my message, right? Which is high. And E is three, which, my, uh, which, which is part of the pub public key. And then mod of N. So I have to take mod of N, which is mod of 3127. So mod taking means that you just divide it by the three one, this number by three one two seven, and your remainder is answer. Okay, so it will be equal to um, this would be then equal to um, seven zero four nine six nine. If you take it in cube of eighty nine, and I have to take mod three one two seven, just divide seven zero four nine six nine by three one two seven, and you will get it, the remainder, which is in fact your C. So it is one three nine four. So this is. Um, P is to the power E mod of N, which is now my ciphertext. Okay, so now this ciphertext, this cipher, cipher is being sent to the channel. And when the receiver receives it, he has to decrypt the message. And he will decrypt the message um, using his private key. Right, so the decryption is done by, uh, decryption is done by D, which is the decryption. It is, the code for decryption is this, that it is C to the, now he has the ciphertext, right? He doesn't have the message. So it is the ciphertext C to the power D and then mod of N. So it is equal to 1394, uh, which is my C and D, which is known only to the receiver um, who has the private key, it is ND, D is my 2011. So it is 2011 and then again, mod of N. So you just need two things, right? A D and an N. So it is mod of N and mod of N is three one, my N is 3127, so it is, um, one three nine four again. You take the power two zero one one, and then you you um, find the mod, and it is three one two seven, and mod three one two seven, and the remainder is simply eighty nine. And so he decrypts the message. So the whole uh, idea behind this is this: that it is very easy to um, um, uh, to compute n if you know the numbers uh, a and b, which are the prime factors of it. But knowing n, it is very difficult to compute. Um, the these numbers a and b of course which make the private key because these numbers this phi of n it it, may, it is made from a and b phi of n is a minus one into b minus one and it makes the private key so it is very difficult to make uh, make this private key um, um, to find phi of n if you know n but how, when is it difficult it will be very difficult when um, when the number is very large so if you if you uh, take the take this number n to be very large then it will be very difficult to decrypt this uh, to to find phi of n from there right to find a and b actually from there so um, uh, this is what the whole idea behind this so it is in fact um, uh, the numbers that um, um, uh, the, the encryption and the decryption scheme is, works like that so this is in use even now this rsa encryption in the internet security and all the, the email passwords and everything is being made, made uh, using this. So um, now the problem is that if you have, um, so uh, as you see, that's, this key has been shared around, right? So uh, there's this key and there's this, this public, this private key, which is, on, uh, which is known only to the receiver. In the earlier cases, when we were using the symmetric key, the key was to be distributed so that it is with the, with the sender and the receiver both. So key has to be transmitted uh, from sender or from sender to the receiver. 
But um, uh, for this um, um, for this method, you don't have to transfer the key. You just need to know to get to know the public key, and then the decryption is done using the private key, which is never circulated, right? So um, in this way, this should be very secure if finding A and B from N is very hard. And it is in fact very hard on the classical computers, but we know that there is a um, there is a um, uh, Schwarz algorithm, and the Schwarz algorithm is in fact a spoiler for um, classical cryptography, right? So it's the Schwarz algorithm. We know, which you will know, in fact, in the computing courses, if you go to the Schwarz algorithm, that um, in Schwarz algorithm, um, it is very easy to compute. Uh, from with the quantum circuit and everything, it is very easy to compute the prime factors of very large numbers, right? So if the shows are good, if there are such computers, which are, um, um, so it is in fact very easy to compute, um, to compute N, uh, to compute A and B, or in this in fact, phi of N, which is A minus one into B minus one from N. Right, which means prime vectors of n. So prime vectorization is very easy of, of an integer, is very easy for, for in short shows algorithm, right? This is the power of quantum computing. So it's not only that, but um, we, of course, we don't have, uh, right now, we don't have our quantum computers which can actually um, uh, run this shows algorithm. And then um, we did need to have fault tolerant quantum computing in order to run uh, shows algorithm that can find prime vectorization, prime vectors of very large numbers. So it's not only that, but the quantum, so right now we don't have, but a quantum computer that can find the prime factors um, will be uh, able to, uh, will, that can find prime factors of very large numbers. It will be able to decrypt all the one way functions. So currently other one way functions that are used are, one is the integer factorization problem, which I just told. The other is the discrete algorithm problem, uh, the discrete, sorry, logarithm problem and the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problems. These are the, all are, these are the various functions, one way functions that are used in the internet security, right? So we are, we have all of them. And um, if a quantum computer that is capable of running the Schwarz algorithm is capable of breaking all of them, is capable of computing all these functions. So that's a real problem because it's not only the show, it's not only the prime factorization, but all, but many other uh, one way functions that are being used that can, and they can be decrypted um, by the, um, by, by the quantum computer, which is capable of running Schwarz algorithm. Okay, so that's the problem. So asymmetric key is, um, of course, um, the ones that we, we know um, are not useful anymore. So we go to the symmetric cryptography again and try to see if we have perfect secrecy, right? If we can have perfect secrecy by any protocol. So symmetric cryptography, as I, as I showed earlier, is this um, that you have a, um, um, but you have the same key, right? Um, and you um, encrypt your message, you take a plain text M and you encrypt your message uh, using this public key, somebody receives it, the cipher text E, M and decrypts it, putting in the same public key. And in the end, it gets the plain text M. So is there any cipher? Is there any code that can be used irrespective of what key is? Um, um, a totally random key, which can give us perfect secrecy, which can guarantee secrecy, mathematically proven secrecy. The other one, upper ones were not mathematically proven ones. They were just the ones that, uh, that um, are difficult to compute, right? On the present computers and the computing facilities available. So there's, of course, uh, it's a good news. That there is one such uh, scheme, which is available, which is called the one time pad or the Fernand cipher. It's all classical, right? I'm not talking about quantum yet, it's all classical. So it is the one time path, which is the which is given by the Fernam. And it's its security was proven given by Fernam in 1926. And it is a mathematically proven secure cipher. So it is uh, called the Fernam cipher. I tell you what it is. So it is the one time path. And why it is called one time path. So it was given in 1926. So um, we have our message, right? So we convert our message to um, to the to to a bit sequence, which is, uh, for example, whatever the message is, we convert it to bit bit sequence, which is um, one zero uh, one one zero one. So this is our message, which is uh, which we want to send, and then we have a key, which is we take a totally random key. So I can take it to be zero one uh, zero zero and uh, one zero. So this is just a random sequence. And I create my ciphertext using addition modulo two of both. What is the addition modulo two? Addition modulo two is that 
I add both of them and then I divide the result by true and the remainder is my modulo two answer, okay? So I add both of them. It is one plus zero is one divided by two and the remainder is one. Zero plus one is one divided by two and the remainder is one. One plus zero is um, uh, one again and the remainder is uh, divided by two, remainder is one. One plus zero, remainder is one. Zero plus one, the remainder is one. One plus zero. Uh, in fact, it comes out to be all one, one, but it need not to be, right? If a totally random key, it can be anything. And um, so this is a simple um, addition model of two, right? If you have a message, you have a key, and you are just taking addition model of two. In fact, this simple cipher, which is called the one time tag, is totally secure. It is, it is uh, mathematically proven secure uh, if or only if there are certain conditions that um, key um, satisfies, right? So it is impossible to break if it satisfies certain conditions. And the first one, of course, is that K, you have to do addition modulo two. So your K key should be as long as M, right? So this is the first condition because you have to add them bitwise, right? So it should have the same number of bits as M. And number two is that that K should be totally random. Um, and then uh, it should be used only once, right? K should be used only once. That is that gives us the name one time. Why it should be used only once? Because otherwise somebody can see the pattern or there's these are being added up and it can guess the key. So um, uh, they guess the message from from the pattern. So and then K is completely secret, right? We have a cipher uh, which is provenly secure, but its key needs to be needs to fulfill these conditions, right? K, K needs to fulfill these conditions. So uh, my cipher text, um, my uh, one, to, um, this simple cipher addition model of two will be totally secure. Now, how to get these conditions that this K um, is, um, 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 this, uh, this key that the cipher text that has been generated from there uh, and the key that has been, that has been used there, how to uh, ensure that all these conditions are met. There are many hurdles in that. First thing is, that the K should be as long as the message. So every time you need to send a new message, you need, you need a new key. So which means that the key should be, uh, should, be um, um, uh, at, uh, should be available at that time. Which means that you cannot say that I want to send 10 messages and I have shared 10 keys earlier and then I am um, secure with it. So you need to have the key being transmitted. Um, uh, you should be able to transmit, to transfer the key um, uh, wherever you want to send the message, right? So it should be done like this. And then how to make, how to randomize it totally. We know that classical randomization is not really a perfect randomization. So you really need some massive method to make it completely random. And then it should be used only once. Again, the same thing that since it should, it, it, it should be used only once. So it means that um, you have to have a new key for every message, which means that you should be able to generate a key at the time or whenever you want to use it, whenever you are done with your 10 keys for the 11th one, you have to generate, it, right? You cannot pre-share all the number of keys because you can only use one key once. And then it, you, it, you have to make it completely secret. You are going to generate the key. You are going to share the key uh, um, between the sender and the receiver, but it has to be kept secret. And this is what QKD, QKD does. QKD, it, um, um, generates key, right? And it distributes it between the sender and the receiver through the open channel, keeping it secret, right? So the QKD does all only this quantum key distribution, right? It distributes this key through the channel, open channel. And um, so it, it distributes key, um, distributes this K um, through open channel. Open channel means that anybody can read it, anybody can see it, anybody can do whatever it wants to do with that and keeping it totally secret, right? It distributes keeping it secret. This is what your um, QKD does. That is why it is called QKD. It's all about quantum key distribution. The method, is the, the message is encoded using one time pad, which is totally classical. The key that has been used in here is totally classical, which is the bits zero and ones, but only that this key will be shared using quantum mechanical method. 
using quantum states, this key is going to be shared. Once the key is made, it is classical. The cipher which we are using is classical, but this cipher is in fact the, uh, is in fact the totally um, secure cipher. So we have a cipher which um, is, is um, very secure and we can distribute the key using this. But the problem is that we have not distributed this key through such a method that all these four conditions are fulfilled, right? And the quantum key distribution promises that. Before going to that, we just see that uh, what if we, um, uh, we uh, are having a one-time pad, but which is a quantum one, right? What if we have such a, um, such a um, one-time pad? So I'm going to the quantum one time pad. So in the quantum one time pad, I have again, um, um, you know, that in quantum states, if you're aware of that, that uh, we can use any basis to represent a quantum state. For example, just like classical bits, there are two, two bit values, one is the zero, Classical bits have two values, zero and one. And similarly, class quantum ones are also two, which are zero and one, these two states. We just put these brackets around them. These are called the cats. We just put them around to distinguish them uh, from the classical ones. And of course, in order to do the linear algebra structure. So this is just the linear algebra notation for that. So there are certain, you, you know, that um, um, in order to represent a quantum state, it's a two dimensional space because it has two values. So it is two dimensional, part of the two dimensional space. Which, which elements are zero and one, but these elements also make the basis set, right? So these are called the standard basis. So these are the standard basis, which are zero and one. And, um, and we represent it by SP. So this set zero and one states are called the standard basis set. And then we can have Hadamard basis, right? Why Hadamard basis? Um, and what are these? So we have Hadamard basis, which we represent as plus and minus, right? These are called the Hadamard basis set. This is also a basis set and we can see why. So we have, what are Hadamard basis? We have the plus state, which is in fact, can be written as in terms of the zero and one, it can be written as uh, zero plus one, the state plus, and the state minus, it can be written as um, zero minus uh, one, and these two plus minus, if you can see, you take the inner product of them and they are totally orthogonal to each other. So they are plus minus inner product is zero. And this, these are orthogonal sets, which means that they can be used as the, um, as the basis set. And these are called the Hadamard basis. Why Hadamard basis? Because these are the eigenstates of the Hadamard operator. And Hadamard operator is simply this. So it is equal to one over under root two, uh, one, one, one minus one, we'll be using it a lot. And uh, this is when you operate it. Uh, so, so we this is the other mod operator and these plus and minus states are in fact the um, um, uh, eigenstates of this other mod operator. But we can see that if you operate this other mod operator on the state zero, which we can of course write as we have written zero over here. So we can, we, we can see how we can write these plus minus and the zero states. So let me first write that. So we have zero, which I can write in the matrix form to be equal to uh, one zero plus zero times one, right? If I write, if I expand it in the basis, then the coefficient of zero would be one and the coefficient of one would be zero. So this will be simply equal to, if I write it in the matrix form, I take this one as here and this zero here, right? So it is simply one zero. And if I write, try to write one, then it will be simply, uh, zero times zero state and plus one and one state, right? So this I will write in the matrix form as this zero over here and this one over here. Now you can see that if you just take the inner product that is multiply the uh, row of this with the column of this, you will get zero, right? So these are orthogonal. Zero and one are orthogonal to one another. But I can see how what happens to the zero state if I apply, if I apply Hadamard operator on that. So I apply H on zero, which is in fact this one over under root two, uh, one, one, one minus one, and it is zero, which is one, zero. And this will be equal to, um, if I can just do it, one plus zero on the top row and one um, minus zero in the bottom. And there's a one under root two. And if you see, this is simply this. This is equal to one, zero plus uh, one over under root two, and I just don't write one with it. So it will be simply zero plus one, which is my plus state. 
okay? And if I apply a hard amount on the state one, I'm just solving it because we are going to use it a lot. And this will be equal to one, 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 two, one, one, one minus one and zero, one. And it converts it into one, one, and two, one and minus one. So this will be equal to uh, one, one, and two, zero minus one. And this is equal to, in fact, the minus state, right? So if I apply how the model zero, it converts it into equal superposition, which is plus. And if I apply it on the one, it converts it into equal superposition, zero minus one. But these two states, plus and minus, are in fact the Hadamard basis state. So you convert from one basis to the other basis set, operating by Hadamard operator. So now how to prepare, uh, how to uh, then, then uh, have, have the key. So let's have a pre-shared key, right? So in this quantum one time pad, we have a pre-shared, just like we have a key K, pre-shared between sender and the receiver. So we have a pre-shared key K, um, which is, um, which is a, um, this is just a set which is made up of zero and one bits, okay? And we have an X kit which converts, um, which when operated, we know it is equal to um, zero, one, one, zero. And we know it is just a, when X is operated on zero, it is you operate on this, it is converted into one. When X is operated on one, it will be converted into zero, right? X is operated on one, it will be converted into zero. So it just flips, right? It is an X kit, it flips, it's an odd kit. And um, whatever I do, whatever you can see, it converts zero to zero plus one, converts one to one addition modulo to zero, which gives you, uh, which gives you one, okay? So uh, which gives you zero in this case, one plus one. So whatever, whatever your message is, when you operate an, M, uh, an X on the message, whatever it is, zero or one, you get an addition of one with it, right? So this is what an X form, X state is there, M plus one. So um, um, we then do the encryption. How do we do the encryption? The encryption is done in such a way that I operate an X game on M, right? And um, I apply my um, X if and only if my K is equal to one, right? So if my K is equal to one, I apply an X um, operator on that and then I'll get um, the, um, XKM from there, which is my encryption, encrypted message. So my encryption is done in such a way that my encrypted message would be this. And then when one when, when has to do, do the decryption, then one applies the, again, they have a pre-shared key, right, K. And he will apply the same, use the same key K. So he will, he will do the decryption using, uh, again, applying the XK. So if I apply the XK on my key E, so it will be converted, it will give me the message back. Right. So I, the, but the main point over here is they have to share the same key. They have to share the, they have to have the same K set with them. So in order to, whether it is, I'm sorry, this should be K. So they have to have the same K set. So again, in this case, uh, they have to use the, um, uh, they have to have a pre-shared key in this case, which is again a problem, just like one time time. You have to have a shared key. Um, now, what if the, sender wants to change the basis, right? So they had the basis set for zero and one, and he was sending, sending using this. What if he wants to um, um, change the basis? So what if the sender wants to, um, to change the basis? So what will he do? So, and which basis to this plus and minus? In the upper one, the basis was simply one and zero. So uh, if I operate again, there is an X operation. So if this question is answered in such a way, there is an X operation. If I do an XK operation on that, so if I operate an X on plus, it will be converted into, it is one, one, then two, um, zero plus one. I, I'm operating a turn plus, so I write the plus in this basis where I know how the X changes changes zero to one and one to zero. So I will have one over one two. So I have to apply an X on that. And it will be one over one two, one plus zero, right? So my X plus would give me plus back. And uh, my X minus would give me what? It is one over one two, X on zero minus one, and it will be equal to 
Dwalo and the root two um, minus um, it will be Z, um, uh, my x minus would be would give me one minus zero, right? So what I will get will be minus minus. Okay. So um, there's a minus sign over here. We know that this minus sign is not readable, right? Because it's just a global phase limit. So quantum mechanically, we cannot read this minus sign associated with that. So what should what should we do with that? We look for some some other operator which where we can distinguish the this the operation uh, the the application of the operation on those states. So let's check another operator. So check z operator. Okay. So z operator is what it is this, um, which is in fact the sigma z operator or the z operator. So it is zero one zero minus one. Um, so um, when z operator is operated on zero, it gives me it is equal to one zero zero minus one. I'm operating in turn zero, which I told you it is one zero. And what I get back is one, the top row is one, one into one plus zero into zero, the bottom row is zero. So, and uh, I will get my number zero, my state zero back. If I operate it on one, it will be equal to one zero zero minus one operating on zero one. And this will give me, uh, one, uh, this will give me uh, one into zero, zero into one, which is simply, which is simply this, zero and minus one, right? So this is again a simple minus, minus one, minus one over there. So it changes the sign of one, right? Just like X changes the sign of, of the minus state and X keeps the plus state the same. The Z operator keeps the zero state the same and it changes the sign of the one. So whatever the X operation is in the zero one basis, it's the same action of the Z operator in the plus minus basis, right? And the vice versa. The operation of the Z operator in the zero one basis is the same as X operation in the plus minus basis. So um, uh, then we use this, that we have, um, so we use X gate to uh, encrypt our message and Z gate to um, encrypt our message in the Hadamard basis. So we use X gate to encrypt the message, to encrypt message in standard basis, right? And we do Z gate to encrypt the message in Hadamard basis, right? So you can see the Hadamard basis that Z on plus would make it minus and Z on minus would make it plus. So it changes the state. It has the same action as the flip operation, right? So we can distinguish between the two encryptions when we are using the Hadamard basis, we can distinguish between the two encrypted states using Z, Z gate, right? And we can distinguish between the two states which are being encrypted by X gate in the standard basis. So if you, are, if you are using the standard basis, we will encrypt it by X gate. If you are using the Hadamard basis, you will encrypt it by the Z gate, that's it. Gates are just the class, just the quantum operations that are being done. These are just the unitary operations, and these are just two sim three simple gates that we are using, X, Z, and Hadamard that we are using over here. Okay, so how do we do the encryption in this thing? So we have to keep in mind that um, if we are using the standard basis, it should be uh, do, do, use the X gate, and if you are using Hadamard basis, use the Z gate. So my encryption would be done in such a way. So encryption would be done as you use encrypt, encrypt, encrypt the message using you have E, which again, you um, operate um, um, uh, your message on in such a way. You have now two, two keys, right? So you have to apply two different gates. So you have two, two keys here. So you have K1, which is also a member of zero and one, whole list of K, K2, which is also a member of zero and one. So it can be anything. So you apply encryption message, you first apply X gate, right? And apply it to K1 and you apply it to the message. And then after you apply this, you apply the Z on using the K2 string. Okay, so it is equal to Z K2, uh, X K1. And um, now for, for um, in fact, um, okay, I write it, um, okay then. So I will now decrypt it. This is my encryption done and I decrypt it. So in order to decrypt it, I have to do the same operations, but in the reverse order, right? So I apply the Z operation first, then I apply the X operation. Later. So my decryption, my decrypted message would be, so I will do the decryption using 
uh, encryption is done like this and the decryption I first applied the uh, uh, my uh, so here the order was xk1 and zk2 so I will apply the um, the uh, uh, xk1 first and then the zk2 on this e right so I will apply the xk1 and um, zk2 on this e so in fact what I'm doing is my e is now uh, my e is um, xk1, zk2, I write this again, and I write my e. My e is zk2, xk1, and m, right? So once uh, you apply the zk2, zk2 twice, you know, you know that the square of these operators is simply the identity of it. So once you apply it twice, you will simply get the identity back. And so this two, these two will make identity, and then I am left with xk1 and xk1, and this is m. Right, so it is equal to again. Again, this is equal to identity, and I get the message back. So my decrypted message is it gives me back my M. Right, I have applied. I've used two key sets K1 and K2. I've used two encryption operators K1 and Z, X and K, X and Z, and then I I will be I, I have got my message back. This is the quantum untangle. You have used the quantum properties. Of course, you have used the bases, two different bases you can use. You can use two different operators which can act in these two, these two bases, and you can then uh, encrypt the message and then decrypt it. This, um, but are you really giving it security compared to, are you really having a key that is being distributed or are you, are you at, one, at some advantage compared to the one time pad, which is the classical one? No, you are not. Because again, you have to share this K1 and K2. This has to be the same between the, sender and the receiver. So this K, K1 that has been used over here is the same that is K1, the XK1, this K1 string that has been used with the, in the decryption. So they all they have to share with the K1 and K2 between them, right? K1 and K2 has to be shared. So again, the problem still remains the same, how to share this K1 and K2. So we have to see what, um, how, how it is. So this problem is in fact addressed by quantum key distribution. Right, this how to how to use so quantum one time pad. In fact, is even though the keys K one and K two are only used once, quantum one time pad is of no extra advantage extra advantage than the um, over the classical one time pad. Okay, so this we know. So this is how it is. So we are we in order to use the one time pad, which of course ensures us um, uh, the um, the perfect secrecy. If the key, but with certain conditions on K that remains in the quantum one time pad only. That is if we if we use quantum states in order to encrypt our and decrypt our messages. So it is not of any advantage, any extra advantage by just using the quantum states on one time pad. We do need some extra stuff, and that extra stuff is provided by quantum key distribution. We will see. How we will distribute this key using the in the quantum in the in the simple BBAT four protocol, but that I will be talking about in the next lecture. So um, here we have to see that the key that has been made, um, the key that is that is to be shared is to be kept totally random, right? And this we know that the quantum state there is an intrinsic randomness in quantum states, right? So there will be certain properties of the quantum states that we will be using in order to. Um, to manipulate the, um, the, um, uh, the, the quantum advantage over the classical key, right? And distribution of the classical key. So these properties are, in fact, randomness comes from the measurement. And so these are two properties that, we, that are very useful in that. One is the measurement. That is, if you do not know the state and you make a measurement on that, um, then um, state will collapse into zero and one, one of the two, right? And the result of the measurement is totally random, right? It can collapse into any of the two. So these two things we will be talking about in the next uh, lecture that no cloning, you cannot clone an unknown quantum states. These are in fact the quantum characteristics that are going to be used. And that is the part of the next lecture. Measurement and no cloning. And that gives you the extra advantage, not by just using the um, the quantum states that we did in the quantum one-time pad, you do not get an extra advantage. You will get that only when you 
make use of these quantum characteristics, which are measurement. That is, if you use uh, if you use uh, different bases, you can you uh, your measurement result is totally random. And if you don't, that is when you don't know the state. And when you don't know the state, you cannot simply make a copy of it, keeping the original. And then, um, of course, this is of advantage in this case. If somebody is reading quantum state flying from one state to the from one place to the other, and he doesn't know the state, he cannot copy uh, that quantum state and keep the original one as well. Right. So this is what we are going to, going to do in the next lecture. And these two things will lead us to DB84, which is a QKD protocol, quantum key distribution protocol. So just keep this in mind that uh, we have the, we, we are just distributing the key using this method, not the message. So once we are perfectly sure that the key is secret, then we can encrypt the message and send it and, until we get a secret key, right? So that is the advantage of quantum key distribution that you are not distributing the original message until you are sure that your key is secure. Right. So this is how it goes. So thank you very much for listening to the first lecture. So um, any questions? Yes, Marlo. Thank you, Aisha. That is really amazing. And there were even some students of you from NAST in Pakistan um, who are great students <laughs> <I'm very> <laughs> here. There are a variety of questions, but I encourage everyone to help each other on Discord and uh, and help each other to to understand everything. Mm -hmm. um, instead, I would like to walk through the next steps with you. I will take over the screen share because for this part, there are some exercises and quizzes on, uh, on Canvas. First of all, we will share the recording of this lecture uh, within the next 12 hours. And you will also share your lecture notes, right, Aisha? Yeah, sure. I'll share the lecture notes. Wonderful. Then if you open the canvas for which you have received the enrollment link and the course link uh, via your welcome email, you see here an overview of the, of the modules and module two is quantum key distribution. This will consist of five lectures as you see here. Today was the first one, on Friday will be the last one. And for each lecture, there will be a quiz which you can pass with a score of at least 50%. And overall, for all quizzes, more than 70% to pass the module. And since this is quite new for many people, also not easy, we have uh, given uh, a couple of weeks to complete this module. Now, what are the next steps? You go to assignments. There, you have filled out the About Yourself quiz that gives you access to the further modules. And then module two is quantum key distribution. In the Get Started, it is explained everything you need to do. Would you like to explain it further, Aisha? Or shall I keep on going? Uh, yeah. Yes, you can keep going. I think it's self-explanatory. So it's, um, it's okay, there. great. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and, and here's the overview. For each lecture, uh, there will be corresponding, let me briefly leave the student view. Okay, so here you can see it. For each lecture, there will be three notebooks. You can download these via the GitHub. Uh, the link is given in the Canvas assignment. So there uh, you have at least three exercises every time that you can do to get more familiar with the concepts. For this lecture, there will be classical cryptography. The well, that... and one thing, uh, these are the notebooks there, right? So you have the exercises in between them. So you, 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 would, you would go to the coding and you can make uh, simple Python coding with that. And then there are some built-in exercises in that that you will be solving there, right? So this is the course content as well. It's most of the stuff that I've taught here, I've taken from there. So you will be able to relate the two things by lecture and about the, what is in that content, right? Right. Yeah, and then by doing yourself, that, uh, then we usually learn most. So for today, these three notebooks, and then the quiz here, quiz 2.1, classical cryptography and limitations. And uh, we have set the due date in two days, uh, because it's really good to keep up with the quizzes. But if you, may, if you don't make it, the final real date is 21st to obtain this module. 
Anything I missed, Aisha? Any questions no, on logistics? It was perfectly fine, thank you. Great, and you have three attempts to do it. Amazing, thank you so much, Aisha. We really look forward to having you tomorrow again. And then everyone will have had a chance to watch the recording again to, uh, to do the exercises to, uh, to get really familiar with the topic. Thank you so much.